Should you pay off your student loans or should you wait for the chance that President Biden will cancel them? Welcome to my channel. My name is Jonathan Arias and I'm an attorney and law professor. I'm also the author of the upcoming book, The Trillion Dollar Question, Understanding the Rise of Student Debt. It's a book where I break down why student debt has gotten out of control. As of this date, student debt is currently at $1.7 trillion and it continues to grow with no end in sight. I break down why tuition has increased so much and why more jobs require more degrees and credentials forcing people into college. You can grab a copy at thetrilliondollarquestion.com or at jonathanadias.me. Whether you should pay off your student loans depends on two major factors, a legal one and a political one, and I'll be breaking down both in this episode. President Biden campaigned on the promise that he will cancel up to $10,000 in student loans for any borrowers that make less than $125,000. Other Democrats, such as Elizabeth Warren, have urged President Biden to cancel up to $50,000 and the most left-leaning of all members, such as Bernie Sanders, has urged the president to cancel the entire $1.7 trillion portfolio. Does Biden have the legal authority to do so? President Biden has questioned if he has the legal authority to act without Congress. If Congress decides to pass a bill canceling all student loans, then your student loans would be canceled. But when you consider the gridlock that Congress has been in, and also the fact that the recent infrastructure bill was not passed, it's very unlikely that your student loans will be paid off entirely by a congressional bill. So now the question remains, can President Biden, as the executive, cancel all student loans? First, I have to acknowledge that President Biden has already canceled billions of dollars worth of student loans for hundreds of thousands of borrowers. For example, he's canceled around $7.8 billion for people with permanent and total disability, as defined by the law, another $5 billion for people in public service, and another $2 billion for people who were defrauded by their schools or went to schools that closed down. Think about Corinthian Colleges or ITT Tech, those sort of schools. So to his credit, President Biden has already exercised his legal authority to cancel tons of student debt. But I will say that this is low-hanging fruit because by the law's standards, these loans should have already been canceled. But because the prior administration was not executing the law as much as it could, people still had to pay back these loans. The first thing to know is that if the federal government cancels any student loans, it will only cancel federal loans, the ones listed over here. Stafford or Direct, Parent Plus, Grad Plus, Consolidated, and potentially Perkins and Federal Family Educational Loans. I say potentially because before 2010, federal family loans were issued by banks and guaranteed by the federal government. Perkins loans were issued by the universities and guaranteed by the federal government. So right now, the Biden administration has the most power over these and the least power over these. If you have private student loans, this won't apply to you, most likely. You can check back in later for my other episode on how to handle private student loans. Moving along, what President Biden would do is that he would order the Department of Education to either waive, release, or modify all the debts owed to it from all borrowers. Under the Higher Education Act, which is the law that the DOE administers, it potentially has this much power. But that answer depends on how administrative agencies work. Federal agencies are part of the executive branch, and they're tasked with the duty of administering and enforcing laws passed by Congress. Let me give you an example. The IRS administers taxing through the Internal Revenue Code, the Federal Aviation Administration regulates air travel and the airlines, the Securities and Exchange Commission regulates investing, and the Department of Education regulates higher education. Agencies 
monitor specific industries or areas of society, and they're often led by and staffed by experts. When Congress creates an agency, it gives that agency a great deal of discretion for enforcing its laws and creating precise rules. It's much more efficient and effective for an agency that has specialized knowledge and experts to monitor a specific area. I'll use air travel to illustrate this. It makes much more sense for engineers and aviation specialists to create rules on how aircrafts, how airplanes should be maintained rather than some congressperson that doesn't have that knowledge. And on top of that, Congress doesn't have the time to review and pass laws on every single regulation. In light of this, federal courts are generally, and I do mean generally because there's exceptions to everything, are generally reluctant to question an agency's decisions when it comes to two matters, on how that agency interprets its statute and whether it chooses to enforce its laws. Let me quickly explain how an agency interprets its law. And I'll use an example using air travel and the Federal Aviation Administration. Let's say Congress passes a law directing the FAA to oversee that all airplanes be maintained in a manner to secure maximal safety. I'm smiling because I just used a long ass and complicated sentence. I hate to have done that, but unfortunately, this is how these laws are written and we have to work with this. Maximal safety, let's focus on that word. It is up to the FAA to determine what that is. Its engineers and aviation specialists may determine that a certain mechanical procedure should be used or that certain tools should be used by the airlines. But ultimately, they are given that discretion to decide on how to do that. And federal courts will generally not review those decisions as long as the agency is reasonable with the rules it creates. The second type of discretion, enforcement. Agencies don't necessarily have to enforce every single violation of its laws. This is similar to the way criminal prosecutors choose to prosecute people. When somebody breaks the law, a prosecutor doesn't necessarily have to enforce the law. It has the prosecutorial discretion to do so. And agencies enjoy that same power. In these cases, federal courts are also generally reluctant to question these decisions. As you can see, agencies enjoy a great deal of power, but they don't have absolute power. They still have to follow certain rules. Let me give you the exception now. Federal courts will review when an agency decides to not enforce one of its rules if the law the agency is to administer provides some sort of guidelines for the agency to exercise its discretion. Let me simplify that. If the law forces the agency to follow certain rules of when not to enforce laws, a court will review those decisions. Here's another point. If a party is unhappy with an agency's decision to not enforce one of its laws and sues it, the court will also try to determine if that agency, by not enforcing one of its rules, has somehow abdicated its statutory duty. I'll say that much more simply. It will try to determine if that agency, by not enforcing one of its rules, is now running counterproductive to its entire purpose. Courts don't review these decisions in isolation. They also try to use common sense and really try to determine if Congress has granted that agency that much broad power. One last thing, agencies have to also follow certain budgetary rules. Before 1966, the federal government didn't have a standardized way of collecting its debts and settling its debts. And agencies that didn't have the power to do so had to refer those claims over to the DOJ, the Department of Justice, and the DOJ had to settle those claims. As you can imagine, the DOJ became extremely burdened by all the claims. And as a result of this, Congress passed the Federal Claims and Collection Act of 1966 and standardized the way agencies collected. It gave them somewhat of a pre-approval for agencies to settle their claims. 
Fast forward to the year 2000, the federal government expanded on this law and now forces agencies to aggressively collect its debts. I'll explain why that's important next. Let's now apply the law we just learned to the Department of Education and the law that it administers, the Higher Education Act. Now, the HEA can be read to arguably give the DOE two broad powers when it comes to loans. The first is that it gives it the power to modify and the power to settle. With modification, the law specifically says the DOE may modify the terms of a loan, including the interest rates and the timing of payments. Regarding settlement, and I want to read this to you, it says that the DOE may enforce, pay, compromise, waive or release any right, title, claim, lien, or demand, however acquired. Very long sentence. But for this exercise, I'll focus on two words that come from the settlement power, waiving and releasing. Let me focus on waiving. If we further define waive, the Black's Law Dictionary, which is the authoritative dictionary that the legal profession uses, it defines waive as to abandon, renounce, or surrender a claim, privilege, right, or to give up a right voluntarily. If we move over to release, the Black's Law Dictionary defines that as the liberation from an obligation, duty, or demand, the act of giving up a right or claim to the person against whom it could have been enforced. With modification, it's quite obvious. The dictionary defines that as to change. I point that out because there's at least one instance where the Department of Education changed the principal and interest payments of a borrowers to zero. The person owed a certain amount and they modified it to zero. There's one final sentence we have to read with these two. Later on, it reads that the DOE's transactions shall be final and conclusive upon all accounting and other officers of the government. Now, if you read these three sentences in isolation, only the text, you can make a reasonable argument that the department has widespread authority to cancel as much debt as possible. What's also interesting is that the Department of Education's Office of Legal Counsel, the memo that was written by the Trump administration, even expresses that this reading would be hyper-literal. In other words, if you were to only read this, then it does give the DOE that much power. But of course, in all fairness and transparency, the memo also states that this will be contrary to the purpose of the Department of Education. But if we only read this, the argument could be made. On the other hand, if we continue reading this text, there seems to be a limitation we have to consider. That limitation is that the DOE cannot settle any claims or debts that are over $1 million. If it wanted to do so, it would have to refer it to the Department of Justice for the DOJ to approve. We also have to consider the budgetary law that I mentioned earlier, the Federal Claims Collection Act of 1966, which directs agencies to aggressively collect its debts. Although courts generally defer to agencies, courts do not analyze their decisions in isolation. They consider other factors and what Congress intended. At this time, the federal government didn't have a standardized way of collecting debts. And in fact, the General Accountability Office expressed concerns that agencies were settling their debts too often and too quickly, which meant that the federal government was losing too much money. When I consider this history, it's hard to say that Congress, considering the way the government was not collecting loans in a uniform fashion, would give the Department of Education the power to cancel its entire portfolio. On top of that, if we consider the settlement limitation from the Department of Justice, it also makes me question whether the DOE has that much power. So how does the DOE get around this limitation? The papers that concluded that there is wide-scale cancellation say that it's pretty simple. The DOJ would just have to approve. And this makes sense. And this would be much more likely when you consider that the DOJ is part of the executive branch. And if Biden can align every single department along with his agenda, then this would be possible. With the FCCA, this is a bit more complicated, 
But when it was passed in 1966, it gave authority to agencies that already did not have the power to settle debts through their own laws. Recall that the Higher Education Act is the law that the DOE administers. When this was passed in 1965, it actually granted the DOE the authority to settle debts. In other words, this doesn't apply as much as it does to other agencies. And I'll flesh this out a bit more next. According to my research, there doesn't seem to be any guideline. The only potential one is the $1 million one through the DOJ's approval, but case law indicates that this wouldn't be enough. The second potential way that a court might get in the way is when the DOE adopted the FCCA in 2016. In that statute, it actually provides four different factors for when the DOE can settle its claims. One of them is if a borrower can't pay or if collecting would be too burdensome, if it would cost too much money. Now, proponents of cancellation say that the way around this would be for the DOE to simply remove that regulation. That would take up to a year, but it could be done. Now, let's say that the DOE does determine that it has wide scale cancellation powers. If somebody tried to challenge this move, the final thing that a court would ask is, has it completely abdicated its statutory duty? If the DOE goes ahead and tries to cancel all student debt, is it now running completely counterproductive to its entire purpose? Opponents of such a move, and there are millions of them, would say that this would be completely contrary. They would say that the DOE runs the student loan program, not the student grant program. It'll be completely irresponsible, at least fiscally, to completely let off millions of borrowers. It will create some sort of moral hazard. You can't bail out people like this. Then on top of that, it won't discipline schools. So absolutely, that would be completely against the whole purpose of the DOE. On the other hand, proponents of wide-scale cancellation would say that this isn't against the purpose of the DOE. In fact, it'll probably further its purpose. In 1965, when the HEA was passed, it was passed under the impression that the United States needed to educate its population. It came right after the GI Bill and the National Defense Education Act. But if we have now reached a point where student debt has become too burdensome and that attending college has become too much of a burden for most people, then maybe canceling debt for people who really need it would further the entire purpose of the Higher Education Act. These are the two main arguments that are at the core of this entire debate. Okay, so there's a handful of other budgetary problems that the Biden administration potentially faces. And I'm laughing because it seems like this video would never come to an end, but that comes to show you the amount of barriers that have to be overcome. I'll quickly go over them. The appropriations clause of the Constitution says that the federal government cannot spend money unless that money has been appropriated by Congress through a bill. The Anti-Deficiency Act says that any heads of agencies that do spend money that has not been appropriated face criminal and civil prosecution, fines and penalties. The Federal Credit Reform Act says that the government can only loan money if the cost of those loans have been appropriated by Congress. And then finally, the Administrative Pay As You Go Act is an act, is a regulation that applies to agencies. And what it says is that anytime an agency increases spending potentially beyond what has been appropriated, it must also decrease spending to make sure it balances its books, so to speak. And if it does increase spending, then it must receive approval from the Office of Management and Budget. How do you get around this? Let me present the problem. It's my understanding that the cost of student loans are not appropriated every single year. So you must be wondering, didn't the Federal Credit Reform Act require the cost of loans to be appropriated before being issued? Well, apparently, student loans are exempt from that requirement. In other words, every single year when Congress, through the DOE, issues student loans, those costs are not appropriated, and that's because the law, as it is, exempts that requirement. The second one, the administrative pay-as-you-go regulation. The research isn't exactly clear on this. It's not exactly clear if K-12 
canceling student loans would increase spending, which would require reducing cost and also approval from the Office of Management and Budget. But proponents of cancellation say that the way around this would be to simply get the Office of Management and Budget on board. They would have to approve the same way that the DOJ would have to approve any settlements over $1 million. In other words, since the Office of Management and Budget is within the executive branch, Biden would have to get his executives on board with his entire plan. It requires a concerted effort throughout every single agency and every aspect of government, as you can see. And here's the final budgetary issue. I promise this is the last one, and that's taxation. In general, the IRS treats canceled debt as gross income. In other words, if I have a loan for $20,000 that I can't pay back to the bank, the bank will write that off as a business expense. It could not recover that. And then the IRS would come after me because those $20, those $20,000, excuse me, would be considered income under the IRS code. What that means is that any cancellation of student loans, any benefits of it, will be quickly destroyed if borrowers receive a hefty tax bill. And I think most people would rather deal with the DOE than the IRS. Anyway, what that means is that the administration must also get the IRS on board. In 2021, Congress passed the American Rescue Act, which basically says that from 2021 until 2025, any canceled student loans would not be considered gross income which means that anybody that has their loans forgiven will not have to pay any income tax on it. But that sunsets in 2025. And if the administration tries to cancel debt anytime beyond that, it'll have to adjust the IRS code. But so far, this doesn't seem to be a barrier because the IRS code has already been written to not tax canceled student loans. The final legal point, and I do mean the final one, I'm trying to respect your time. I'm just gonna wing it with my laptop. I left it to the end because I think it's the most important one. Let's say the DOE does try to do something as aggressive as canceling all student loans. Who would stop it? Who would stop it legally? Who would ask the federal courts to review the way the DOE interprets the Higher Education Act? This is where the legal concept of standing is so important. Federal courts will only hear what's called in the Constitution as cases and controversies, and they will not hear political questions. They do not address those. I know you must be asking yourself, isn't this entire episode, isn't student debt completely political? And I would say that it probably is. But for purposes of this video, the biggest barrier to anybody who would challenge the DOE would be this. It would be that it would have to prove that this was actually a case and a controversy that could be resolved by a federal court. This doesn't mean that Biden or the administration can't be voted out. The whole purpose of this cases and controversy clause of the Constitution says that for any political questions, those must be resolved through the political process by voting people out. Canceled student loans will most definitely affect the federal budget. After all, these loans would have to be recouped back, the cost of them, through higher taxes. These are the arguments against this. So a group of taxpayers could theoretically come together and sue the Department of Education under that premise. But the research shows that a group of taxpayers would most likely not get over this standard, this barrier over here. Anyone that tries to sue the DOE to stop a program like this would have to prove three things. Number one, that the act of canceling student loans caused that party an injury in fact, a direct injury in fact. Secondly, that that injury in fact is fairly traceable to what the DOE did. And then finally, that this act, if it is stopped, could be redressed or fixed by a federal court. Now the research over here says that a group of taxpayers, which would be a likely candidate to sue the DOE, would be too far removed from this. And in these circumstances, the way to address this would be to use the political process. That's what this whole standing standard is about. That if people are unhappy with the way the federal government is 
conducting itself. And if it is not a case in controversy, then people are forced to vote the heads of government out of office. But this doesn't mean that another group, another set of parties can't sue the DOE. Taxpayers as a group probably can't, but servicers and investors most likely can. Let me focus on servicers. These are companies like Nelnet or Navient or Sally Mae, they're notorious companies. If the DOE cancels student loans, those will most definitely adversely affect those companies. Servicers, after all, service loans. They collect money from students, they place them on payment plans, and a large share of their revenue comes from the DOE and any interest and principal payments that are made through them. So canceling student loans, the research says, would in fact cause an injury that is of course traceable to the DOE and which a court, if it stops, would at least keep them alive. Secondly, investors, another interesting group. Before 2010, banks were the ones that issued loans to students. After those loans were issued, banks would package them, pull them together, and then sell off the interest, the rights to the interest to investors. So again, if the, do, if the DOE cancels all student loans, those investors who are expecting those returns would be injured the same way as servicers. I would say this, these two groups are not very popular, especially Sally Mae, which means that if they were to stop such an aggressive move by the DOE that could help millions of people, this might place them on an even deeper shit list than they're already in. But who knows? Maybe taxpayers could come together and force these two entities to challenge the DOE. So we've reached the end. I really want to thank you for sticking along the entire way, even if you fast forward to where we are right now. Just make sure you grab a copy of my new book, The Trillion Dollar Question. Don't play me, get a copy. Now, I started off the video with a simple question. Should you pay off your student loans or should you wait on the possibility that Biden will cancel them? And that question largely depends on the legal authority that he has. My answer, <laughs> and I hope you don't hate me for this, but my answer is maybe. It depends. I know that's the safest, lawyerly, non-answer I could have given you, but the law is steeped with uncertainty. What I wanted to do here, however, is show you that the framework is absolutely available. If Biden wanted to cancel tons of debt, the framework is there, he can walk into court, so to speak, and make the arguments with a straight face. Now, whether this will be politically sound is another question that I address in the following video. He may not have the authority to cancel $1.7 trillion, the entire portfolio, but he certainly has the power to cancel a crummy $10,000. And I don't mean crummy in a disrespectful way, because $10,000 is a lot of money. On top of canceling debt, even if it's only $10,000, Biden has a unique opportunity to reform, completely revamp the student loan program. The Higher Education Act actually has many provisions that should have prevented millions of borrowers from holding on to debt that they shouldn't have. But because prior administrations were not executing the HEA as effectively as they could have, Millions of people were holding on to debt that legally they should have not been holding on to. And that's a unique point because most people would be on board with reform. In the following video, I'll show you exactly how he's reforming and then I'll give you much more precise recommendations on what you should do.